Um, but it's problematic because when we look at the whole American dream, you know, anybody can do it. You can do it. We all know that's not really the case. You know, you can work your ass off and still, if, if work translated obviously to the amount of money uh, that you that you receive via salary or whatever, it doesn't work that way. Um, so, but in our society, we tend to think if people are successful, whatever that might mean, it's because of them. They did, they're, they're hard working, they blah, blah, blah. If you're not successful, it's your own damn fault. Right? That's problematic, particularly when we have certain public policies and all that. Institutionalized racism, blah, 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 blah. So we have uh, what communication scholars call the fundamental attribution error. And that is when we, when we see people do things, we attribute that to something. Um, for instance, I went to several restaurants last week, um, and we all enjoy going to restaurants. My favorite is McDonald's. I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> we went to this really fancy tasting place. Have I done this? Told this before. It's, it's, I just think it'd be cool to have like a tasting menu and, with like fast food stuff and pair with some sort of wine. Today we have the delightful rosé paired with the McNuggets. In any case, so if we get a, a server, he or she ain't too good, what do we tend to think? That person's not good. Maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe they got some bad news right before uh, they got to work. Maybe they feel Maybe they're sick. So in other words, we tend to blame or attribute behavior to individual lies or whatever rather than context. So for instance, somebody does poorly in school. It's your own damn fault. You're not studying enough without thinking about maybe that person has like three or four jobs. Um, so we tend to think in terms of we attribute behavior to individual characteristics, although context tends to be a much better predictor of this or that. Right? If you grow up in poverty, it it's a it's a cycle, right? Okay. And a lot of doctors don't get that because a lot of doctors do not come from poverty. Then they move into talking about health literacy, because I think a lot of folks who you know, have that knowledge gap. And on page 127, uh, there's sort of a definition of uh, health literacy, individual's ability to access health information, understand it, and to apply it in ways that promote good health. You gotta understand the language in which information is conveyed have access to reliable, relevant information, be interested in health-related information, blah, 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 I'll let you read that. Um, <laughs> Giuliani, you all know Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York. He, he, he wasn't very, he didn't have health literacy. He thought positive was a good thing, and it was tricky, right? You've been tested positive, blah, blah, blah. Oh, that's cool, yeah, I'm positive. Um, but it sort of goes into talking about uh, words and, and problems. <sighs> I'll let you read that. But um, so I think it's linked um, socioeconomic and health literacy. And health literacy is so important. One thing that I would encourage you to do, page 129, it starts the stuff on uh, the communication skill building and surmounting status and literary barriers. So. Uh, suggestion for public health care uh, professionals um, the professionals oftentimes are you know, like the folks at the CDC um, pandemic influenza prevalence can frighten and confuse rather than inform what's a pandemic in the first place like there's pans there's pans all over the place there's a pandemic and there's what are they gonna use the pans for cooking 
fried steak. Pam on a pan. Pam, pa pam, pam. You don't want your stuff to stick. Use multiple formats. Uh, uh, suggestions for healthcare providers. Suggestions for patients. Ask three quick, three key questions, says the American Medical Association. What is my main problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? So, um, so look at those skills. Uh, and then we just move into a lot of stuff about issues of gender identity. And uh, it's a lot of this stuff is sort of basic theory stuff, uh, but we do live a in a world, the, a heteronormative uh, world, in which we tend to just think, you know, through that lens, um, and that's not always uh, the case, um, and it impacts everything under the sun um, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, health uh, situations. Um, for example, some of the assumptions, you know, if, if uh, it says, do, 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 point out the quandary that begins with intake paperwork at Dr. Supply. And then they ask the same questions over and over and over again. How would a lesbian woman answer the question, have you ever had sexual intercourse? If she says yes, her doctor may assume that she has sex with men, thus she should consider contraceptive and so on. If she says no, the doctor may assume she is not sexually active because you, you, know, you have that heteronormative sort of thinking. Heteronormativity just assume everybody's straight. <laughs> they were boring. I, never mind. I'm not going to go into all that type of stuff. But in any case, I like the whole thing. When, you know, flip the things. When did you know that you were heterosexual? Hmm. Okay, so, and people who try to cure homosexuality, you know, the American Psychological Association used to say it was a disease, but they saw the light. And the more information we find, it was just amazing. My sister is a lesbian, and she has a child, and, um, and just, it's, she, there was one doctor in Oklahoma who was willing to do the procedure that she went through to be inseminated. Basically, it was like a turkey baster, I think. I wanted her to use the family turkey baster. Um, but I think she had to do something more medically, something or other. So, if you go back to my very first uh, little lecture with my niece, Jaden, she's, she's a product of a turkey baster. Oh, I'm such a cruel, terrible person. Uh, love my niece very much. Um, but, you know, there's, there's lots of things to consider when you think about issues of, of gender um, and sexual identity, and, and, and it's bigger than just male and female. There's all sorts of different stuff going on here. Uh, I like the communications uh, skill builders for this. Um, and then we move into issues of race and ethnicity, and obviously, uh, you know, it says racism can make you sick. That is the conclusion of studies linking the race to well-being, medical care, and life expectancy. Um, yeah, racism is discrimination based on person's race, obviously. Uh, in the United States, race is associated with life expectancy. The average lifespan of an African American male is 72.3 years, which is more than four years short of the overall male average in the United States. Same with women. in part because of racism. Research shows that the link between health and race is social rather than biological. In other words, people of minority status do not suffer ill health because of the genes they are born with, but because of what occurs during their lifetimes. So we'll talk about different care and outcomes. Generally, people, African Americans, but I would broaden that up to people of, of color generally, um, receive different care. There's explanations why they receive different care. Oftentimes patients distrust the system and the doctors 
There's all sorts of reasons. I'll let you read that, but yeah. Then it moves into talking about all sorts of things dealing with language differences. Obviously, that can be problematic. But that's why a lot of healthcare organizations now have interpreters, and, which is important. When we can't tell everybody, just you know, learn American. <laughs> what do you speak in American? That just ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna work. Uh, I'll let you read the language barriers, disabilities. Um, oh, yeah, different care for different folks. What you talking about with the fact that there are different strokes for different folks, but really, there's different care for different folks. Language barriers, dis uh, disabilities. You know what ableism is? Ableism is the idea that ability is linked to physical in a sense um, that uh, you know if you cannot run you are obviously disabled I know there's some mental stuff going on but the whole thing is, is really problematic even the idea of handicap is problematic um, people are using language differently and, uh, individual disabilities are often confronted with frustrating dichotomies for when people tend to either treat their disabilities as the most important thing about them or self-consciously to avoid the issue entirely. Lots of stuff going on there. Age. Oh, uh, there's great uh, communication skill builder on page 144. Uh, talk to people with disabilities directly, not to their interpreters or companions. Remember to identify yourself to sight impaired persons, treat adults with disabilities as adults. When a person with a disability is difficult to understand, listen attentively and then paraphrase to make sure you're heard correctly. So what I hear you saying is this. Whenever possible, sit down and speak to people in wheelchairs so that you can communicate at eye level. That's really good. Relax. For example, don't be embarrassed if you accidentally say, see you later to a blind person. Don't insist on helping people with disabilities if they don't ask for help or if they decline your offer of assistance. Respect their wishes. Heed the wisdom of Thuy Fondu and Patricia Geist, who remind us everyone is other, is other to some extent. We all possess disabilities, whether visible or invisible. So that's some really good stuff. Then they move on to age. Um... age is funny one thing I can't remember where it was um, and I'll let you look at all this stuff about talking to children um, but I think it says in here that children are not <laughs> little adults there's actually there was a uh, thing in one of the um, magazines I was reading in Charleston you know, if you've ever gone to a, a beach house people leave magazines there that's one of my favorite things to do look at coastal magazines I'd rather look at coastal magazines than look at the coast. Um, I'd rather listen. I have a, <laughs> I have a little, you know, those sound things that you can get on uh, your apps or whatever to, to help you go to sleep, whether it's little, you know, spa music or, uh, um, or white noise or, or whatever. But I have a, a series of things. And one of them is waves at a, at a beach. <laughs> and so I'm at the beach <laughs> listening to... <laughs> You know, this technological sound of a beach on my iPad, <laughs> and I'm at the beach. Uh, yeah, okay. But, oh, any of these magazines, they had these kids dressed up as little adults, and like, you'll treat your child adult. And kids are not little adults. They, uh, they don't, <laughs> you know, and some adults aren't adults. They're children, too. Perhaps they haven't got to the formal logical conceptualization. I'll let you read some of that stuff, but if you end up being a child or a pediatrician or a parent, uh, let the child set the tone, which is better. Pay attention. Yeah. Disease and etiology appear consequential or of negligible concern to children. Yeah, you think? Okay. Then they move to older adults. Murren. Women can only be sexy if they are young. She, oh, no, that's not true. 
Where was that? Uh, 